presenting the Zigzag Follies of the Air, starring Fanny Bryce and James Melton. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the Zigzell Follies, presented tonight and every Saturday night by Colgate Palm Olive Pete, to introduce you to Palm Olive, the world's largest selling beauty soap. The soap made with olive oil to keep skin young and lovely. <laughs> Opening night at the Follies tonight, and every one of you through the magic of radio has a seat. A seat to the greatest show on Broadway created 29 years ago by that master showman of America, Florence Siegfeld. The Siegfeld Follies, cradle of the world's greatest entertainers. From this stage, the master showman Siegfeld presented unknowns. Overnight, they became stars. Eddie Catter, the lovely Nora Bays, W.C. Fields, Golden Voice, Ruth Edding, Gladys Glad, Marilyn Miller of the Twinkling Feet, Fanny Bryce, the lovely dancer, and Pennington. The famous black-faced comedian and singer Bert Williams, Leon Errol, James Barton, and most loved of all, the late Will Rogers first gave out his home, the American philosophy, over the lights of the Zeke Fell stage. Do you wonder there's excitement in the air? It's another opening night, another opening of the greatest, the most extravagant, the most beautiful show on Broadway. Excitement out front, people clamoring for tickets, everyone heading for the Follies, excitement backstage, outside Fanny Bryce's dressing room. Tell Miss Bryce it's me, James Melton. Oh, come in, Jimmy. Sit down a minute, Jimmy. Say, I'm all excited. So am I, and scared. I always get shivers up and down my spine before an opening night. And tonight is more than just an opening night. Think of it, Jimmy. We're bringing the Six Cells Follies to every corner of the United States. It's just got to be good. You bet it has. Ten million people will be listening in. People in California, Omaha, Nebraska. Every person in the United States can hear our Six Cells Follies tonight. Say, uh, what are all those telegrams on the table? Wires, wires from all over the United States, Jimmy. Look, here's one from Billy Burke. Mm -hmm. We'll be listening into the Follies here in my Hollywood home, just as if I were there. Stop. Tom Oliver is to be congratulated. Good luck. Here's one from W.C. Fields. Thrilled to hear Flo Zigfeld's Follies is being broadcast. I'll be with you by radio. And look at this one from Marilyn Miller. I'll be with you as of old, though I'm thousands of miles away. Good luck. Here's one from Ruth Etting. And another from Leon And one Miller. from Gladys Glad. <laughs> Telegrams, telegrams, telegrams from Eddie Catter, from Ruth Edding, from W.C. Fields. Telegrams from every corner of the nation, from stars who will hear the Ziegfeld Follies of the Air in their own homes. Yes, and you too, in the comfort of your own easy chairs, can enjoy every scene. Laugh at the comedy of our feminine star, Fanny Bryce. Thrill to the great songs of James Melton, our singing star. To the lovely voice of Patty Chapin, Broadway's newest sensation. To the music of Al Goodman's orchestra. To the dancing and singing of our famous Ziegfeld Chorus. Yes, thrill to the Follies tonight, opening night, and the story behind the Follies. The story of Alice Moore, who wants to see her name in electric lights. The story of a girl who wants to become a star in the Follies. Let's follow her now as she walks down the alley to the entrance that leads backstage. Alice. Oh, Eddie. Well, what are you doing here? I just had to see you for a minute or two, so I came here. We haven't had much time together this last week or oh, two. Oh, I know, Eddie. I've been so busy getting ready for the Follies opening night that that's, I really... That's just what I wanted to come here to see you about, Alice. We're going to be married in two weeks, and I've come to ask you to give up this usher's job tonight. Oh, but, Eddie, I've told you it isn't just the usher's job. It's, it's a means to an end. What end? Well, Eddie, you see those great big letters in electric lights with Fanny Bryce's name? Mm hmm Well, someday you're going to see my name up there. Alice Moore. Oh, no, Alice. That really isn't what you want. You want a home. Oh, of course not. Now, but listen, dear. We're going to settle down and raise a family. Oh, Eddie, I want those things, too, but... But first, I've got to make a stab at this. Oh. I've got something inside of me that won't let me rest. I want to be somebody, Eddie. Oh, so when I walk down the street and I see electric lights with big names on them, something inside talks to me and says, Alice, that's going to be you someday. Oh. Someday, somehow, some way, I'm going to be famous, Eddie. I know it. Why, why I can see. Yes, oh, maybe you don't know. think so, but I know it. And I'm going to make the whole world know it. Oh, I'll make you so proud to have me as your wife. You've made up your mind? Mm-hmm. And you won't quit this, this usher job tonight? 
No, Eddie, I won't. Alice, it isn't as if I didn't have enough money. I can support you. Oh, it isn't you, Eddie. It's me. It's it's something inside that's bigger than me. Bigger than you two, Eddie. Bigger than both of us. Oh, what? Oh, there's no reason why we can't both work. After I get to the top, we'll have our family, Eddie. But but first, I want to... You're sure this is the thing you want? I'm sure, Eddie. More than you want me? What? Well, what do you mean? I mean, unless you quit your job tonight and give up this foolish stage idea, the wedding is off. We're through. You you mean if I, if I don't quit tonight, you don't want to marry me? That's right. It's one thing or the other. No wife of mine will work along Broadway in this theater atmosphere. But, but Eddie, you don't understand why it's only to begin... Oh, that's fine. And I want your, uh, your answer now, Alice. Now. Now? Yes, now. Well, Eddie, maybe... Maybe I'm a fool, but... I'm hitching my wagon to a star. I've got to go through with this, no matter what the consequences. That's final? Oh, Eddie, I... Is that final? Yes. Then, goodbye, Alice. Eddie. Eddie, I'm sorry. Please understand. Goodbye. Goodbye. So Alice Moore chooses between marriage and a dream. Now she enters the theater to take her place at the head of aisle two. Thick and span in her braided Folly Theater uniform. What will the Folly's opening mean to her? The feeling of suspense, of tension is in the air. It affects everyone in the theater. Actors, stars, writers, musicians, stagehands, ushers. Yes, and of course it affects Alice Moore. In this theater lie her dreams. Dreams of success, of glamour, dreams of stardom. We follow her as she takes her place at the head of aisle two in the Folly Theater. Second aisle over, that's right. Arlene, let me have some of those programs. Mine are all gone. Hey, what do you do, Alice Eden? No, my section's about all full already. You make a full and theater five times tonight, huh? May I see your tickets, please? First stairway to the left. See, some people are dumb. They got balcony written on the tickets. What's the matter, Alice? You're awful pale. Don't you feel well? Uh, I just broke up with Eddie. What? After going with a boy for two years? Say, are you crazy? Maybe. Listen, Alice, all I can say is think twice before you walk out on a good guy. Say, Irene, would you do something for me? Maybe. What is it? Give this note to Fanny Bryce. A note? Why don't you give it to her yourself? Oh, I haven't, I haven't the nerve. I want her to hear me sing. I wrote it about a week ago and... Oh, I'll just give it to her, will you, please? Oh, stage truck. <laughs> sure, I'll give it to her. Do it now. Maybe she'll see me after the first act. Yeah, Maybe. The lights are dimming. You could go backstage now. Well, Chance, you know Fanny Bryce is as nervous as a cat before the curtain goes up. I told you I'd get it before you, uh... the first act's over. Well, where are you going? Backstage. Well, give her that letter, will you? That's what I'm doing. A letter to Fanny Bryce. A letter and a prayer. It is a moment of moments. Out front in the boxes, Lady and Ermine, gentlemen in tails. In the orchestra seats, in the balconies, in the ball headed row, people eagerly awaiting the opening of the new 1936 Follies. Out of the door in the orchestra pit comes a keen-looking man in white tie and veil. He steps onto the conductor's stand. It's Al Goodman. He takes the bow. He's opening his 110th show. He smiles to his wife in the seat behind him. Up goes the baton, and the overture begins. The 1936 Follies has begun.
through the great Mr. Ziegfeld's famous portals, past the world's most glorious mortals. And that brings us in view. So, in order to set every brain a whirl, we'll glorify the American girl. We promise you music and drama and fun. So settle yourself, and you'd better be quick, for the curtain is rising on scene number one, an unsettled ditty called Rhythmatic. Our good If I lay two eggs over here... Oh, Professor, I don't believe you can do it.
feel you there beside me, and I would humbly kneel before you to say how madly I adore you. You. Come when I called you. I didn't hear you the first two times. <laughs> Snooks, look at the mess in this parlor. With well, the vase is broken, ink on the carpet, the window is smashed. Did you do this? No. Now, don't look down at your feet, Snook. Look in my face when you answer me. Who made this mess? Nursey got it, darling. Why, Snooks, you know Nursey is off today. Yeah, but she came back and done it. I seen her, Daddy. You did, eh? Well, why is your dress covered with the same ink? She spilled ink on me, too, Daddy. Snooks, you know that Nursie went out of town this morning to visit her sick sister. She couldn't possibly have come back. I forgot. She done it yesterday. Yesterday, this room was in perfect shape. Now, Snooks, tell me the truth. How did this happen? Why did you break that vase? I had to do it, Daddy. You had to? Why? On account of the three rattlesnakes. What three rattlesnakes? What did you say, Daddy? You said you had to break the vase on account of three rattlesnakes. Yeah, Daddy. They came into the parlor and I killed them. Snooks, you know you're not telling the truth. Well, uh, maybe it was only two rattlesnakes and a cake of palm olive soup. <laughs> now, how do you expect me to believe a story like that? There couldn't possibly be any rattlesnakes in the parlor. Yes, there was, Daddy. There was one in here, and I killed him. There isn't a rattlesnake in this whole part of the country. Well, it was an awful big worm. <laughs> a worm in the parlor. Show me the worm. I can't. Why not? The eagle ate it up. <laughs> what eagle? The eagle that knocked over the bottle of ink. Now, listen, Snook, I've had enough of this. I want you to tell me the truth. If you tell me the truth, I won't punish you. 
Now promise me you won't fib anymore. All right, Daddy. Now what happened? Well, I took off the ink bottle to write a letter. Yes. And a big lion jumped in through the window and scared me. A lion jumped through the window? Yeah, that's how the window got through. I see. Well, if a lion jumped through the window, why didn't the pieces of glass fall on the outside? Well, the lion jumped in backwards. <laughs> Go on. So I ran into the other corner, and there was four lions, and they all jumped on me, Daddy. And then what happened? I got <laughs> How could you tell me such stories about lions? You know you never even saw a lion. I did so, Dad. Where did you see a lion? Mrs. Smith has one next door, and that's the lion that came in. Mrs. Smith has a lion? You know very well that's nothing but a little yellow dog. Now I want you to kneel down and pray for forgiveness for telling so many fibs. All right. That's it. Now you pray to the Lord to make you an honest child. All right. That's a good girl. I'm finished, Daddy. Mm -hmm. Did you pray? Yes, Daddy. And the Lord said, I forgive you, Miss Snook. The first time I looked at that yellow dog, I thought he was a liar, too. <laughs> I can tell the ladies and gentlemen in the audience something about you glorified American girls that they see on the stage. But, Mr. King, be discreet. After all, we have to eat. Oh, I'll be discreet, I promise. They are beautiful, aren't they, ladies and gentlemen? Gloriously beautiful. You bet they are. And if it's the modern girl's duty to be beautiful, I think they perform their duty well. Which brings me to the real reason why I'm appearing on the Folly stage tonight. These girls use the beauty soap I'm going to talk to you about, palm olive soap. And I'm sure it has helped in their glorification. That's right, isn't it, girls? Thank you, Mr. King. What's the uh, average age of you glorified girls? You promised, sir, to be discreet. Our years and days, we won't repeat. <laughs> That's right, I did promise discretion. But the fact of the matter is, friends, that while these girls are young, some of them are not quite so young as they look. They all do look young, very young. Not one of them looks to be out of her late teens. Why? Because of the care they give their skin. As I said, they use palm olive soap, the famous beauty soap made with olive and palm oil. Now, if you will use palm olive soap as they do, you will keep the skin young, fresh-looking, lovely, or recapture its old youthfulness and beauty. Let me tell you why. Nature gives the skin certain oils, Youth oils, whose work it is to keep the skin soft, smooth, young. Without them, the skin becomes dry, rough, and old-looking. Made with olive oil, palm olive soap protects these youth oils of the skin. And that's how the smooth, gentle lather of palm olive can take years from the appearance of your skin. 
palm olive soap has helped to glorify these girls here and millions of others all over the world. And palm olive soap can help you to have a lovelier, fresher, more gloriously youthful skin. Then don't you think it would be well worth your while to try palm olive, to begin using it regularly and exclusively tomorrow, and quickly bring added glamour and youth to your skin? kind of good advice that it leads to wedding bells and life. And that brings us to you. So, to keep, keep you all happy, we always contrive. We think you'll find laughter is scene number five. It's a song, yes. a dance, yes. and a story of romance. Mm. You'll be delighted. And a tenor. And it's rare. The bride comes home to title, meaning mm. that is what it's called. Al Goodman. <laughs> should be fast asleep by now. What's ailing? Where's Elmer? Then <laughs> 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 
and his wife reaches out from her first row seat and clasps his hand. Backstage, everyone is gathered around Fanny Bryce. Everyone. James Melton in white tie and tails. Patty Chapin in silver sequins. The glorified court of girls in their midnight costumes from the finale. Stage hands and shirt sleeves and suspenders. They're all talking. Congratulations, Fanny. I thought you were swell. Oh, how about yourself, Jimmy? Oh, good to see you. Thank you, Fanny. I hope so. Say, who is that little girl walking towards Miss Bryce's room? Huh? Oh, I don't know her name. What are the ushers out for? Good looking, Chip. Oh, oh, finally. Say, don't you think we have enough to do to strike this set without you coming around here? Well, I'm just going to Miss Bryce's room. Why don't you stay in your own side of the tent? Joe. Yeah? Joe, where's Miss Bryce's room? She don't want like business between acts. Oh, she's expecting me. Oh, yeah? Uh Uh-huh. Where is it, Joe? Right in front of of you. Don't you see the big star placid on the door? Oh, oh, thanks. Look out. Do you want to kill yourself? Knock first. Don't walk in. She's changing her costume. All right. It's, it's me. Yes? 
I, I want to see Miss Bryce. She can't see nobody now. If you got a message from the front, I'll take it. Who is it, Jenny? One of the ushers from the front. Alice Moore, tell her. Alice Moore, Miss Bryce. Oh, tell her I'm sorry. I can't see anybody now. Uh, tell her I'll see her for a few minutes after the show. Miss Bryce says she'll see you after the show. Oh, thanks. Hey, did she get my letter? Yes, I think she did. Thanks. I'll be back right after the next act. In just a few moments, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in the Follies Theater for the second act. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York. Presenting the Zigfeld Follies with Fanny Bryce, James Melton, Patty Chief, and Al Goodman's orchestra and the Zigfeld Chorus, glorifying the American girl. This production is presented to you by Palm Olive Soap. Use it for your complexion, for your bath, for shampooing your hair. As you see a fresh glow in your skin, as you notice a new and youthful glamour in your complexion, you will realize why it is that Palm Olive is the preferred toilet soap the world over. And now, on with the show. And the ushers all have said, there's nothing like a uniform to turn a lady's head. And that brings us in view. So, the boys will march as thick as starch to start our second act. And as they sing, your ears will ring with joy you may have lacked. The changing of the guard is what we've understood. It's scene number seven, and it's uniformly good. Forward march! <laughs> Painting of the guard, stand maybe within the palace guard. And if you please to enter, then you can to know to do the rail to what from there. The changing of the guard. Come on, come on, come on, come there. You see the changing of the guard. And stand maybe stand within the palace guard. I touch your pride and pomp on every hand. The shop, the car, the welcome, and behold, behold, the changing of the guard. Have you been to London? Never been to London. When you come to London, oh, tell the public the truth. Walk down the street, take in the treat. For there's the usual thing. And if you're south to see on houses, why not join the king? Go down the road to come to London. <laughs> So 
overjoyed, even though I'm destroyed with a love like this. Tonight I love you, so it frightens me. For every kiss you give enlightens me. I feel this danger in everything you do. When I am close to you, your eyes have warned me. It's dangerous to love like this. Every glance means beware of the thrill that we share in the sound so heavenly. warned me it's dangerous to love like this every kiss in the dark is igniting the spark that is burning inside of me and uh, your caress is so tender I'm afraid I'll surrender my very love to you. Your arms have warned me. It's dangerous to love like this, but my heart's overjoyed. Even though I'm destroyed with a love like this. presents an extravagant comic, for you can't save on laughter, so why be economic? We think you've guessed who we're referring to, our favorite star, Miss Fanny Bright, to you. C9's an agency supplanting Cupid's dart, a place where marriages are planned. Fanny plays two parts, Miss Bright. Come in. Ah, Mrs. Schultz. Well, what can I do for you? Hello, Mr. Bell. I'm looking for a husband. Why, Mrs. Schultz, I furnished you with a husband last week. Yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. <laughs> well, say, I remember when you and Mr. Schultz got caught in a revolving door. Was that the first time you met? No, but that's when we started going around together. <laughs> well, Mrs. Schultz, I've got just the man for you. A wealthy widower. A wealthy widower? Yes, and he'll treat you right. He'll give you a party. And before you're married, he'll give you a shower. A shower? Yes, and I'll come to that shower. Tell me, what shall I bring? You bring the palm olive soap. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Bright's in a different pose. As back in the bureau she goes, all right. Ah, oh, the top of the money to you, Mr. Barnes. I'm a poor, witty woman, and it's looking for a husband I am. Well, I'll try to accommodate you, Mrs. O'Reilly. Tell me, did you get along with your last husband? Sure, we lived like a couple of lovers. Of course, once in a while, O'Reilly would get drunk and bait me up. And occasionally I'd lose me temper and crown him with a rolling pin. But never once did he have to call in the police. Did he ever strike your children? No, only in self-defense. <laughs> he was good to me and the children, poor mm -hmm. Mike. Tell me, did he did he ever come home and throw his arms around you? Sometimes before I could even strike a blow. <laughs> well, I've got a fine man here for you, but he wants a wife who's a good cook. 
What's your favorite dish? Whiz Mike. It was the heaviest one I could lay my hands on. Who was your husband before O'Reilly? He was a man by the name of Quinn. Well, that's a good old Irish name, Quinn. <laughs> Did he spell it Q-U-I-N-N? No, he wasn't Irish. His name was Quinn. C-O-H-E-N, Cohen. <laughs> but I really didn't step out here in front of the curtain to accept applause. No, indeed, not that I don't like it. I love it. But I really came out to tell you a little something about scene number 10. You know I've been in the folly through 18 years. I've watched youngsters come in unknown and almost overnight become stars. Seen them come and I've seen them go. And what memories? Memories of great performers. My friends Eddie Cantor, W.C. Fields, Marilyn Miller, Ruth Eddy, and Gilda Gray. Oh, I could name them on and on for hours. And tonight, as we launch this new Zeke Fells Follies of 1936, we've worked out a Follies review to bring back some of those memories. Memories of other performances when slow zigzags glorified the American girl. The producers have asked me to introduce this review to you. So, Al Goodman, if you're ready, bring up the curtain. Oh, oh, when under a full harvest moon shining bright sat Miss Nora Baines and her lover one night, Back in 1908, was a wonderful sight. Shine on, shine on, harbor blue, nothing but sky. I ain't had no nothing since April, January, June, or July. No time. with the googly eyes. The last year of the war, he gave us a surprise. When Cantor sang this, the applause you'll surmise. Look her in the eyes and every time she sighs, you forget your family. The other evening in a cabaret we spent. When I saw the check, I thought it was the rent. But when the waiter came, she simply signed her name. That's the kind of a baby for me. Oh, so when John Steele sang this song, the girls all would be. It's since been selected as slow Zig Bell theme. After 17 years, the song still is to free. Calling more, more, and more. <laughs> 
Mr. Gallagher. Oh, Mr. Gallagher. Hello, what's on your mind this morning, Mr. Keene? Cost of living went so high that it's cheaper now to die. Positively, Mr. Gallagher. Absolutely, Mr. Keene. I'll never forget sunny Marilyn Miller. And she was so good. Lo, well, just add to Villa in a girl's minstrel show that was surely a thriller. <laughs> Backstage, the chorus girls are getting ready to scatter, too. They're in their dressing room, taking off makeup, carefully hanging up colorful costumes. 
They're talking. I can hardly wait. Gee, I'm so excited. Oh, I've got to wire my mother right now. Oh, now I can buy that darling evening wrap I saw in socks the other day. Oh, oh here comes Henry to see. Who's he? Well, don't you know? He's the greatest makeup expert in the world. Oh, yeah. Well, hello, girls. Say, I wanted to tell you, that makeup looked great tonight. It did? It certainly did. Well, it comes off nicely, too, Mr. Despain. Well, that's good news. Because I recommended a supply of palm olive soap for you girls to use when removing did it. Did you recommend palm olive soap for our showers, too, Mr. Despain? Yes, I did. Good for you. It's the best soap for bathing I've ever used, and it's not one of those strong smelling soaps, either. Right. You know, it's a funny thing, but many people seem to think they've got to use a strong smelling soap for the bath. They're afraid that otherwise they won't be. Well, won't really feel clean. You know, if I were one of you girls out there in the front line, I wouldn't use anything but palm olive, either for your faces or your bathing. You want to keep young looking. And you don't want some hard-boiled stage manager to say to you someday, Say, babe, you're getting too old for the folly. <laughs> when you're only 26 years old, palm olive helps to keep your skin young. Well, girls, good night. Good night. Congratulations and have a swell time at your party. Thanks. Good night. Good night. They're off to the party. They're off to gaiety. But Alice Moore, what of Alice Moore, the little usher? She's going backstage to talk with Fanny Bright. And for Alice Moore, that's the greatest event in her young life. We'll follow her backstage. Oh, come right in. Thank you. Janie, come on. Look this thing for me. I'm coming. Sit down, Mr. Moore. Alice Moore. Oh, yes. Get the shoulder strap straight, Janie. Yes, sir. I read your note, Alice. Did you, Miss Bright? It was awfully nice of you to read it. If you notice the date on it, I wrote it about ten days ago. Uh, did you? Uh, my slipper, Janie. Just there. Well, well, if you're too busy, I can come back some other time. Oh, it's all right. Do you think you can sing? Is that what's bothering you? Yes, Miss Bright. I can do every one of your songs. Every single one of them. <laughs> Not as good as you do them, of course, oh, but... Oh, don't do imitation. Do something of your own. Be yourself. Nobody gets very far copying. That's what imitations are. My other slipper, Janie. Yes, sir. Well, I can do things of my own, too, Miss Bright. You can? Uh-huh. That was a long letter you wrote me, Alice. That's just how I feel, Miss Bright. Maybe they're just cold words written in ink to you, but every word I wrote came right from inside of me. Oh, you must have felt once what I'm feeling now. I guess I did. But I wish I'd had somebody to tell me when I'm going to tell you. Yes? If you had the talent of ten Fanny Bryce's, I'd say, stay away from it. Oh. And someday when you've married a nice boy and you have a lovely family, you'll come back and thank me. Oh, I won't. I, I know I won't. You love what you're doing. You couldn't do it if you didn't, Miss Bryce. Well, I'm only asking you to help me. Some people to see you, Miss Bryce. In a minute. My dress, Jenny. Yes. Will you? Well, won't you just let me sing for you sometime? Don't tell me those are real tears. Well, I only wanted you to hear me. And if I tell you that... That you haven't anything, will you give it up? No. No? No, I won't. Well, you've got something. I don't know what it is, but it's something. Miss Bryce, some people to see you. Tell them to come in. And I guess that's my exit cue. Right now it is. But I've got an entrance line for you, too, Alice. Oh, Miss Bryce, that's grand. Here's a chance. I'll take it down. Butterfield 78492. Mm -hmm. Call me up uh, tomorrow morning at 11. Now I want to hear you. Butterfield 78492, got it? 9492. Oh, yes. Don't lose it. Don't worry, Miss Bryce. I won't. Alice Moore holding tight to a slip of paper with Fanny Bryce's telephone number written on it and a promise of an audition leaves the Folly Theater happiest song in her heart. She has looks, ambition. She has courage. What is her destiny? Is it linked up with the Follies we heard tonight? Is it linked up with Fanny Bryce, James Melton, and Patty Chapin? We'll see. We'll see. We'll be here next week for the second edition of the Ziegfeld Follies of the Air with the greatest, the most popular hits of Broadway today and yesterday. The Ziegfeld Follies of the Air. Don't miss it. Don't miss the story behind the scenes, the story of pretty Alice Moore. Music, drama, comedy, and thrills next week 
in the Ziegfeld Follies. It's a date with your radio. And if you live in New York or are coming to New York, don't miss seeing the Ziegfeld Follies in person at the Winter Garden Theater. As you listen to the Follies tonight, friends, we hope that you paid careful attention to what we've had to say about palm olive soap. We hope, too, that no later than Monday you will act upon these suggestions. We'll get just three cakes of palm olive from your dealer. See for yourself the wonders it can work in bringing new smoothness, new beauty to your skin. And now, until next Saturday night, palm olive bids you good night. Columbia Broadcasting System.